Well, I want to make what we're going to do today kind of short and sweet, but I do want us to spend this time together thinking about spiritual things. Amen? And so I just brought two things to share with you today. One of them is a song. One of them is my favorite reading about this occasion. And I will tell you though, I just went through and I picked out some highlights. I didn't get the whole thing. Um, we did that last March up at West Virginia, you know, when we read that chapter. And I think the whole chapter only took us about 45 minutes, okay? So it's not that bad, okay? We're just going to do the highlights today. But it is from the book, Desire of Ages, called A Servant of Servants. Who is the servant of servants? Jesus. Jesus. You know, that might sound strange to somebody the first time they hear it. Because you think, no, Jesus is the Son of God. You know, anything but a servant. But it's very interesting. We read it this morning in Sabbath school. Our God, I mean, the Almighty Father, is as a servant, at least in his mind, doesn't he serve us? I mean, he's doing for us all of the time. And of course, Jesus came here. He condescended to come to this world to be a servant. And he was truly the servant of servants. Well, this chapter is about the foot wash washing. The Ordinance of Humility. And you can find it on pages 642 through 651 in this book, The Desire of Ages. And it starts like this. It says, In the upper chamber of a dwelling at Jerusalem, Christ was sitting at table with His disciples. They had gathered to celebrate the Passover. The Savior desired to, desired to keep this feast alone with the twelve. He knew that His hour was come. He himself was the true Paschal or Passover lamb. And on the day the Passover was eaten, he was to be sacrificed. He was about to drink the cup of wrath. He must soon receive the final baptism of suffering. But a few quiet hours yet remained to him, and these were to be spent for the benefit of his beloved disciples. What is that? How does that make you think about Jesus? Wow. <laughs> yeah, wow is a good word, isn't it? We are his new disciples. We're his modern day disciples. Amen? Amen. So I believe he cares the same about us. As he met the disciples in the upper chamber, they perceived that something weighed heavily upon his mind, and although they knew not its cause, they sympathized with his grief. As they were gathered about the table, he said in tones of touching sadness, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. On this last evening with his disciples, Jesus had much to tell them. It was his last time. He was about to be crucified, and, and then they were going to be on their own for a while, weren't they? Right. So it's the last evening with his disciples, and he had a lot to tell them. It says, if they had been prepared to receive what he longed to impart, they would have been saved from heartbreaking anguish, from disappointment and unbelief. But Jesus saw that they could not bear what he had to say. You notice the words that she uses here. Jesus longed to give them a message, didn't he? Heart felt and then heart breaking anguish would come because of the lack of this. It says, there was a strife among them which should be accounted the greatest. When they went to that upper room, what was going on? I mean, their minds were anywhere except where they needed to be. Isn't that right? right? So I put that in for that 
purpose that we realize that they came to that service with the wrong, very wrong attitude, didn't they? I hope we haven't come here today with the wrong attitude. Amen? Amen. The disciples made no move towards serving one another. They got there. They're all seated there. There's the basin, and there's the water, and there's the towels. But there's no servant. What do we do? Well, what would you do? I mean, I hope it would be the natural inclination to say, I could do that. I could help do that anyway. Hey, let's you and me go, go do this. Something, right? right? But the disciples made no move towards serving one another. Jesus waited for a time to see what they would do. And of course, they did nothing. Then, He, the divine teacher, rose from the table, laying aside the outer garment that would have impeded his movements. He took a towel and girded himself. With surprised interest, the disciples looked on and in silence waited to see what was to follow. I mean, they see what Jesus is doing. And it's kind of shocking to them. But it didn't move them enough, did it? What should they have done? Don't, don't you think they could have told they could have told Jesus, no, 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 we'll do this. I mean, you feel like Jesus should be the guest of honor. Amen? I don't care what kind of meeting it is. With surprised interest, the disciples looked on and in silence waited to see what was to follow. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. This action opened the eyes of the disciples. Bitter shame and humiliation filled their hearts. They understood the unspoken rebuke and saw themselves in all together a new light. Now, I learned a lesson a long time ago. Heard him say, wisdom is learning from your mistakes. And another person answered back and said, no, true wisdom is not learning from your mistakes. True wisdom is learning from somebody else's mistakes. The truly wise person learns from somebody else's mistakes, and they don't have to go through the same heartache, do they? Well, it's interesting. When we read what's in this book, why do you think it's written down for us? Why do you think it's there? It's because if we're wise, we can learn the lesson from what happened to them way back there and not go through the same garbage ourselves. Isn't that right? right. So they understood the unspoken rebuke and saw themselves in altogether a new light. And I'm asking the question, can we get the rebuke without actually doing the wrong, necessarily? And can we see ourselves altogether in a new light? You know, we've probably done our share of wrong. I, I get that, okay? But we're not specifically doing what it says here today. But can we still feel the rebuke? And I think so. I think we can understand that given the right set of, uh, set of circumstances, I would come to that meeting with the same wrong attitude that they did. Right? So, Christ expressed His love for the disciples. Their selfish spirit filled Him with sorrow, but He entered into no controversy with them. He didn't fuss at them. He didn't scold them. He was hurt by what they had done, but what did he do? He loved them. And he used that love to share something that they desperately needed with them. After Christ had washed the disciples' feet and had taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Know ye what I have done to you? Do you know what I just did to you? 
And you know, some of us would go, well, duh, you washed our feet. <laughs> but do you really get it? Do you really get what just happened? Christ would have his disciples understand that although he had washed their feet, this did not in the least detract from his dignity. You know, when the one who is to be called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords over the whole world and yea, the universe stoops down to wash my feet, something's wrong. Right? right. Something's wrong. But it ain't wrong with Him. There's nothing wrong with Jesus. And Jesus is showing that you can come all the way from the throne in heaven to be the servant of servants. And that's a good thing. That's not something to be embarrassed about. It's not something to be ashamed of. That's being Christ-like. That's being Jehovah-like. That's being God-like. Isn't it? Yes, it is. That's the lesson that we want to learn in this service here today. In His life and lessons, Christ has given a perfect exemplification of the unselfish ministry which has its origin in God. Where did Christ's ministry have its origin? In God. In God, in the Father. God does not live for Himself. Remember that week? I don't know what exactly we were studying about. But we quoted John 3.16 and I said, God is a giver, not a taker. If we're going to be like God and like His dear Son, we're going to be givers, not takers. Amen. Right? God does not live for His self. By creating the world and by upholding all things, He is constantly ministering for others. That's even the Father, right? right? And of course, Jesus is the servant of servants here. Now, having washed the disciples' feet, he said, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. In these words, Christ was not merely enjoining the practice of hospitality, which would be a good enough thing, wouldn't it? Because how we treat other people is the very most important part of our religion. Somebody say amen. Amen. It doesn't matter how many Bible verses we know. I believe that's important. It doesn't matter how well we know the doctrines. And I think that's very important. But all of that pales next to what we do with the love of Christ. That He showed to us that we should be showing to others. Right? right. But it was not merely enjoining the practice of hospitality. More was meant than the washing of the feet of guests to remove the dust of travel. Christ was here instituting a religious service. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? They were at a religious ritual service right. called the Passover. Mm -hmm. Okay? The Passover ended that night and a new ritual service was born that night. And we call it the Lord's Supper. Communion. Mm -hmm. Right? But not that only, there's another one that we call the ordinance of humility or foot washing. And the one we're going to read is the preparatory service for the other one. And so Christ was here instituting a religious service. By the act of our Lord, this humiliating ceremony was made a consecrated ordinance. 
That's the reason we do it. However often we do it. Once a year, twice a year, four times a year, that's okay too. But however often we do it, we do it as a consecrated ordinance. It's meant to teach us a lesson. It's meant to teach us a way of life, isn't it? And so both of these ordinances, the Lord's Supper and the foot washing, are very, very important. It says, yeah, I was messing with the thing and getting ahead of myself. All right. This ordinance is Christ-appointed preparation for the sacramental service. While pride, variance, and strife for supremacy are cherished, the heart cannot enter into fellowship with Christ. We are not prepared to receive the communion of His body and His blood. Therefore, it was that Jesus appointed the memorial of His humiliation to be first observed. You get that? What was Jesus' humiliation? Boy, we can think of a lot of answers to that question, can't we? But it all started right there in this upper room with His disciples. Because in a certain sense, they humiliated Him. You get what I'm saying? Not really from Jesus' attitude. Okay? They couldn't... They couldn't bother Jesus with this stuff. But, the ones that He sometimes called His children were so dense as to overlook their duty where each other was concerned, let alone the public at large. So it's very interesting. Jesus appointed the memorial of His humiliation here. To those who receive the spirit of this service, it can never become a mere ceremonial. And it's very easy for us when we do rituals. We don't have a lot of them. But we do have a few, like baptism, like the communion and, and the ordinance of humiliation. We perform rituals to remind ourselves about very, very important lessons, don't we? kind of like the feast days were back in Old Testament times as well. It's very important that we keep things in their proper perspective and don't get lost up in the ritual itself. Because you can just sit there and blah, 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 go through the motions, and it loses all of its meaning, doesn't it? So the real purpose of this is for us to look back and to learn the true wisdom. Learn from the mistakes that have already happened. Its constant lesson will be, by love, serve one another. Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. In washing the feet of His disciples, Christ gave evidence that He would do any service, however humble, that would make them heirs with Him of the eternal wealth of heaven's treasure. We were reading our book on Wednesday night in Christ Object Lessons, and I think it was last week, we come up on page 151, and I said, oh, here it comes, one of my absolute favorite quotes, right? Well, it is one of my favorites. There's another one in that book. I think it's on the very last page of the book. There's a wonderful um, illustration about a vacuum. Not a vacuum cleaner, but a vacuum. We'll get to it. But look at this. Because this is my absolute favorite quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. In washing the feet of His disciples, Christ gave evidence that He would do anything. You hear that? Anything. No matter how humble, anything 
that would make them heirs with him of the eternal wealth of heaven's treasure. A simple way to put that is Jesus would do anything for them to be saved. Amen. <clears throat> the real story of the Bible is that the Father and the Son would do anything in this world, anything in this universe for us to be saved. Amen. Anything. Amen. There's no limit to what they did. When you give your only begotten Son to save the world, there's nothing you wouldn't do. There's nothing that comes close to comparing with that. Right? Amen. Jesus would do anything to make us heirs with Him of the eternal wealth of heaven's treasure. His disciples, it says, in performing the same rite, pledged themselves in like manner to serve their brethren. So the way Jesus got down on his knees, so to speak, squatted down and washed the feet of Judas. You know who he washed first? Judas. Judas. The very one. Do you think Jesus meant it when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? I mean, the fact that he washed Judas' feet is enough, but he washed Judas' feet first. And by the way, do you know who's, whose feet he washed last? John. John. The very closest one to him. And you know, there's something to be said for the fact that if you truly are close to Jesus, that doesn't bother you. You can wait. There's no lack of confidence there, is there? So Jesus does that for us, and then we do it for each other, and then we, you know, we do it for each other. But then we do it for anybody. Everybody. Amen? Amen? Whenever this ordinance is rightly celebrated, the children of God are brought into a holy relationship to help and to bless each other. They covenant that the life shall be given to unselfish ministry. And this, not only for one another, their field of labor is as wide as their master's was. Who did Jesus come to save? The world. The world. Amen. The world is full of those who need our ministry. What is our ministry? You can answer that a hundred ways. Easy. But I'm going to tell you the best answer. Our ministry is Jesus. Right? right. What does the world need? Jesus. Jesus. How can they have it? How can they find Him? How can they know? They've got to be told. They've got to be told. I mean, that's what we read in Sabbath school, I think, just last week, right? How can you hear without a preacher? How can there be a preacher if we don't send them? Right. Jesus, the served of all. Go back and read that council of peace between the Father and the Son where He brings Jesus out and presents Him before all of heaven and the universe. Okay? Because that word's going to come out. But he presents him before all of heaven and he says, this is my only begotten son 
This is the one that I want you to aim your worship at. Right? Jesus was the served of all. The Father exalted him that everybody in the universe would worship him because he is the Son of God. The served of all came to be what? The servant of all. A servant of servants. That's really simple. Jesus was the master. We're the followers. We're the disciples. He was the teacher. We're the disciples. If we're going to be Christians, we ought to be like Christ. Amen? Amen. So, it's a really simple thing. This sentence should describe us. It should describe us perfectly. Jesus, the servant of all, came to be the servant of all. What are we here for? To serve for service. We're here for service. We're here to be the servant of them all. And of course, he says, if you know these things, if you know the purpose of his lessons, happy are ye if ye do them. Amen? Amen. That's it. That's the part from the Desire of Ages that I like. I just love to share it with people. I should feel bad about doing it so many times, but I don't. Because I think it is, honestly, the biggest lesson that we all need to learn. And it's not enough that we learn something and then forget it. It's not even enough that we learn about it and aren't reminded of it. We need to be reminded, don't we? And of course, the Bible is filled with these kind of things. But the Bible tells us something very, very important. It says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Amen? Who is so great a God as our God? Our God is the true, the living, the one God. Amen? The Bible says there are gods many in the world. But it also said they're not real. They're not alive. But they're not true. And so, we read today that the Passover was coming. That's what they were in the upper room for. And so, that brings the Passover into it. And I, it's an opportunity for me to share a song with you that I have just become infatuated with. I really love the song. It really touches my heart. And I hope it will touch yours. But I want to share this song with you today while we talk about this. The Passover has ended. Uh, but you know, just because Jesus is not the Lamb slain anymore doesn't mean He's not the Lamb of God. Right? Doesn't the Bible call him the Lamb of God right to the end of the book of Revelation? It does. And so, um, I think it's very interesting the lesson that can be learned from the Passover. Because it is all about the blood. Amen? That door represented our being under the blood. And you know where Jesus is at right now? He's not the Pass it's not the Passover anymore. He'll always be the Passover lamb. Right? But he's not performing the Passover now. He's in the heavenly sanctuary before the Father's throne. And he's putting his finger in the blood. In his own blood. And he's putting it on the horns of the altar. Seven times. Listen. I pray that we can listen to this song as closely as possible. This song tells the Passover story 
from a different perspective. We always think about what's going to happen at the Passover. If you don't have the blood, what happens? I will lose my firstborn son. Now that's important. That is important. God gave His first and only born son. Right? It is important. But what about the Son? Listen to this song. <laughs> One dark night in Egypt time had come for one little Hebrew boy who was his father's firstborn son. Now with the angel of death passing low, it was hard. But one little lamb stood in his mind as he lay there counting sheep. He wondered why that young lamb had to die, why his blood Say
somebody get the wrong impression about what I'm trying to present here the blood is still there you don't have to worry about the blood washing away there's nothing that can take that blood away from us can we take ourselves away from the blood yes. obviously obviously we don't believe in once saved always saved that's not anything like this is to present to us but who was it that put that blood on the door. I got two answers for you. It was the Father. So in some way, this is symbolic of our Heavenly Father. Right? So it was put there with love and care. Amen? And in addition, the Father was known as the priest of the household. Isn't that right? And who would the priest represent? Jesus. Jesus, right. Jesus is our priest. And so it's Jesus that puts his blood, right, on the horns of the Father's throne. That's where we're at right now. Nothing has changed. We still have to be under the blood, right? This is the whole point to it. But we can realize that that blood is Jesus. It is the blood of Jesus, isn't it? And here's a picture I found online that illustrates things pretty well. John 10, 9 says, I am the door. So when we're putting that blood on the door, who is that? Jesus. Jesus is the door. And you can think about it. His head had that crown of thorns. He sweat great drops of blood even before that. So there's blood across the top of the door. There's blood all up and down the right and the left of the door. Right? Well, I got good news for you, folks. This is all about Jesus, and it's all about Jesus' blood. And right now, today, it's still about the blood. It's all about about the blood. And what we do here today, we, we're going to talk about the blood. We, we're going to go through the ritual like we always do, and we're going to talk about the blood. But folks, I just wish there was some way for us to feel deeper that <coughs> Jesus right now has bloody fingers. Right? right. What's He doing right now? He's, he's pleading our cases before the Father's throne, isn't he? God help us. Well, folks, we're going to separate now for the ordinance of humility.